Okay, folks. Here we have what is either called outdated, venerable, time proven, or something. Namely, it's a discussion I first started developing um, almost uh, 35 years ago about how to give some general analogies as to the principles of parallel computing. Uh, so, this is part of the cloud computing unit because clouds are um, uh, effectively always using parallel computing. And this is part of the big data applications analytics uh, class offered by intelligence systems engineering in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering. Okay, here, uh, well, uh, this is the description of the, of the uh, unit. It's parallel computing in pictures, or parallel computing in society. Or or why parallel computing is known to everybody, because whenever we do anything, we use parallel computing. As I say probably later, we don't use super person to solve a problem. We use lots of ordinary people to solve the problem. All right, so if you look at parallel computing, there's certain very general principles. The first is you have to decompose the problem. If you want to get lots of people or lots of ants or lots of computers to address a problem, you better bet, take that problem and chop it up into parts. Sometimes those parts are actually chopped up by the world. Uh, when you're doing the um, parallel computing job of running uh, Uber's cars, uh, actually, by definition, each of the cars is separate and we don't have to decompose by cars. The cars are naturally separated. If I'm doing parallel computing to solve the weather prediction for the next hurricane, I actually have to choose how to take the mesh points where I define the velocity and pressure and so on. And how I chop them up into, into groups and put each group a subset of um, mesh points on each, each node or each task of the parallel system. And depending on what we're looking at, we're either doing the data the model, or we're actually doing often the both. When you have big model and big data, you decompose both of them. And we give some examples in the following of uh, particles in a cosmology simulation, computer chess, um, actually some, again, 30 years, 35 years ago, I, my group competed in the World Computer Chess Championship when it wasn't quite as well understood as it is now. And our problem was that our, we had the best parallel code by far, but our parallel computer broke down. So we didn't do so well compared to people not using parallel computing. At that same time, we used to work on what was called the Strategic uh, uh, Defense Initiative, and we have a little discussion of how you use parallel computing in, in that problem. We look at a bit of tweets, we look at genomics, and we look at Google News. All of these problems consist of a lot of things. There are a lot of documents in Google News. There are lots of gene DNA fragments in genomics, and there are lots and lots and lots of tweets from Twitter. And there you use parallel computing by finding what the right thing to break up is. Um, <coughs> And uh, taking the things correct to break up and chop them up. Another actually very important thing, which is not mentioned here, which you often break up is users. When you uh, Google puts to resigns this cloud to support the world, uh, it's actually designing it so it's parallel over the world's users. So each user does their web search independently or in parallel using different, different uh, tasks on the Google Cloud. So, let's look at decomposition in a little more detail. And uh, we first have some rather more general remarks um, uh, about parallel computing. I mean, these clouds are very large, I mean, a typical Supercomputer or at the cloud can have to have 100,000 uh, servers in them, and you can get a million or so cores, each of which is independent. So, so these um, 
backend servers are really very, very parallel. And uh, you have to decide whether to use that parallelism over users, over tweets, or over tweets and users, over websites. Because when you say do a search, uh, you can have, I don't know, tens or hundreds of millions of users doing search. And each of them can search and parallel the web. Um, so, and then the typical, this is this user parallelism. When your phone accesses the internet, it goes to the back end cloud, and that cloud assigns a little core to, to, to process you, usually possibly using a PubSub subscriber to queue you up. And uh, you can do lots and lots of simultaneous requests. Um, so this is parallelism over users. Um, but you might need a more sophisticated parallelism to access a giant database. The world's search is done by accessing a giant database, which has been accumulated in parallel by, by sending um, uh, things to, to troll, the, troll the web to um, bots to troll the web to, to get all the information. Then you might do recommender engines, which have a model, and then you have to take that model and find its parameters. You might do a large clustering with lots of cluster centers and lots of data. And we've already said that databases and search engines are pretty similar. Uh, this is what's sometimes called data parallelism. Uh, but data parallelism is also used in um, Almost everything, whether we're doing weather forecasting or, or, um, or web search, they're all using data parallelism. It's just what's just the word data sometimes really means model parameters. That's what's true in the weather forecast case. You might have some parallel data being uh, processed, but most of it is parallel model, with the model parameters being effectively for the computer, the user defined data. So we can therefore do uh, the, the basic parallelism for accessing for the internet is <coughs> taking the users and chopping up the <coughs> problem by users. But we can also um, simultaneously for each user, we can assign several cores so that the user has a large job. Uh, and those multiple cores can work together to solve that problem for the user. I pointed out what happens when we do computational fluid dynamics for weather or for airflow to see how well our plane will fly. Uh, you take, you define a mesh, and you take the mesh points which have various field values to find out them, pressure, density, velocity, and you chop them up into parts. And here the data is, I say, rather confusing because it's really model parameters, not data, and that's the mesh points. For search, the data is the web pages. For e-commerce, the data is the things you're trying to buy. And it's also the people who are, who are both buying it and also whose record has been left to form the recommendation uh, information. And for k-means, the data is the points to be clustered. K-means also has a model, which are the cluster centers. And you would sometimes, you would also Sometimes distribute the cluster centers, although for the k means normal clustering, you don't. You have the set, you replicate the cluster centers on every, um, on every uh, task of the system. That's because you've already noticed that the number of data points is much larger than the number of cluster centers. And so it's sufficient to decompose the data. For things like, um, Deep learning, you might well actually distribute the model, because the model is huge for deep learning. All those um, neurons and their interconnects, well, the interconnects are typically the thing you're determining, the weights on the interconnects. And those weights of the model, and it's that model parameters which are decomposed. So we split big data into parts, but each part on a separate core. Um, and we can uh, store the data in disk, or we can store it in memory, or we can have a you know, memory resident database, which is sort of says that it goes to disk as necessary. 
and we first start looking at a simple 2D scientific simulation. And those have a special feature which was, was still exploited, namely that is that coming from solving differential equations? Differential equations are solved numerically by discretizing the um, differential operator. When you do that, you get connections between neighboring points, because the differential is the value of the point minus the value of the next nearest point divided by the distance. And so simulations have a lot of geometrical locality built into them. That is not nearly so true in big data problems. They don't have natural locality, and so you don't get these uh, special features from uh, geometric nearest neighbor type structures. All right, here's a very old slide. I probably again did this 35 years ago. And we're thinking of solving a two dimensional scientific equation. Maybe it's the Plasse's equation. Del squared phi equals four, four equals four, plus or minus four pi rho. Del squared is d by dx squared plus d by dy squared. That you then translate into a, into a difference equation, which relates as shown here, nearby points. This point here, in each step, only requires the values at these neighbors. That's what happens when you convert del squared as a differential operator into Operationally, um, what you need to do to calculate it numerically, which is the sum of these four, which is proportional to the sum of these four points here, minus four times the point in the middle. So, all right, so that was a, didn't mention parallel computing. So, what happens if I do parallel computing? Well, here I have 16 processes or tasks. And I just chop up that uh, little uh, two-dimensional picture into 16 parts. And so this, there's a task up here which has nine points plus seven static points, where the due to power conditions, you know what's going on. There's a process in the middle which has 16 points. And there's a processor on the edge, not at the corner, which has 12 points. So the actual number of points for this simple case varies so significantly. But for a large problems, these edge effects will not be important. And you wouldn't see big differences in the number of points per processor. Here's a more complicated problem, which is, uh, is again very old, but the principle is the same even on modern calculations. That if you have airflow over a wing, you get turbulence and very rapidly varying pressures and things. and uh, that gives you a mesh which is very dense in some places, like here, and very um, coarse out here. And if you just did a uniform mesh, it would be very inefficient because you would have to have a very, um, very small mesh size to be able to cope with the variation here. Out here, where the all the fields are varying slowly, it would be inefficient to have such a coarse mesh. You want a, a, such a fine mesh, you want a coarse mesh like we've shown here. So this is showing that this concept of points and things, even in one of the world's simplest problems, which really stems from the beginning of parallel computing, we knew that we had to do look at irregularity and different distributions of mesh points. And so that in order to get efficiency, you tended to want equal number of mesh points per task, which is different from equal areas per task, so a big difference here. Um, in order to get the same um, performance, you would need hundreds and thousands of, of processes here to do the same thing as for the same region as you have over here. We have a similar size region, you would only need maybe one task to process that region. So. That illustrates an important feature in this decomposition, which we're discussing. That you, um, once you've decomposed, uh, different parts of the decomposition may have different computational complexities. Here's a, a very old um, plot of uh, which illustrates the same thing for gravity. 
just due to Newton's laws being attractive. When you have, um, the, if you look at the density of stars or the density of galaxies in the sky, they're incredibly non-uniform. In fact, they're most non-uniform when you get a black hole, which really, really grabs everything up and captures it in the very, very high density uh, um, system. And so, in order to do uh, to simulate the motion of this collection of stars, you would need to put more activity here than you would over here when there's hardly anything going on. So. Um, that actually is different with repulsive forces, <coughs> where you do not get some drastic clustering. So, in biomolecular simulations, <coughs> you will find much smaller effects than this. But this effect is huge in, in gravitational problems. Here is a rather couple of whimsical examples. Um, when I first did this slide, I was in. Pasadena, California, and so um, even nowadays, probably California would like to be independent. And uh, so, exposing here, we are sitting in, in um, the National Missile Defense Unit, and we saw uh, various missiles being launched from uh, this unfriendly state. We would actually take, we would not, we would uh, divide the problem by the number of missiles, and might put one. A few certain say one to ten task on this problem, another one to ten on this one, <coughs> and so on. So this is an equal missile decomposition, and um, this can be very irregular if the missile sites or the distribution of missiles after they've been launched is very irregular. Uh, it's still geometric, but it's not the same um, geometrical constraints. Here we have a famous example of the how this is not actually how, uh, you, how when computers play chess they just calculate the chess tree and they go down looking at all possible moves with certain clever selection techniques and then they um, um, take those moves and evaluate them and, and evaluate them and they look at the best evaluation after you've gone down I don't know certain number of steps, 10, 20, 30 steps. And in order to do that, at least one approach to computer parallelism is to have lots of nodes. Each node does a sub each nose does a subset of the possible steps. So I've marked that here, where we have node zero having this one, this one, and this one. Node three is over here. And so on, node one and node zero and two. So then we need to chop up by, um, we just chop the node, the, the uh, moves up. There's no locality in this problem, it's not such a clear locality. And there's no reason, that's not so obvious, you have to respect any nearest neighbor structure here. Uh, and you, so you may do some sort of random, less, less um, formalized, uh, Decomposition, but you're going to have roughly one equal number of moves in each processor because it's going to take you eventually an equal amount of a given fixed amount of time to calculate the um, the um, the value of each position. At the end, you just score the position. That scoring has a certain amount of computing attached to it. Here's an example coming back to the. Uh, uh, the cosmology problem, at least a related problem to that. Suppose you have a bunch of uh, points, and um, they're distributed like this. Maybe these points are galaxies or stars. Then, if we did the um, if we did the equal decomposition, then uh, it would actually not be so good. Like if we chopped here and here. You will find this processor here, this task up the top, top right, it has all the points. And the other three tasks have too little. So there are two types of approaches. I've drawn one here, which is to cunningly do a geometrical decomposition, which is still um, 
sort of contiguous uh, uh, area uh, areas, and um, that's one approach. Another approach is to actually what's called the scatter decomposition. You just scatter the particles uh, randomly over the over the um, processes. Uh, for this type of for data problems, you just do totally random. For this type of problem where there's locality, you actually do not scatter particles, you scatter regions. So you take your, if you have, I don't know, four processes, you might define 400 regions, and you scatter 100 um, regions per processor. Why you want regions is then each region would have multiple points, and you can exploit the locality within the region. So it's sufficient within each region. So. Here's this example here, it's not perfect, it's much better than the original case. The number of points per, um, the number of particles per node varies from 16 to 28. And this again is a 100 years old slide, and I see I even misspelled particle. So I did that misspelling in 1983 or sometime like that. All right, that's the slide. Okay, in this slide here, I point out that in almost all problems, not all, at least all non-trivial problems, the different uh, tasks need of a parallel job need to communicate with each other or synchronize with each other. For example, if I chop the points up in k-means, I'm not going to get um, all the points of a single cluster is put in one single node, not usually. So in order to <coughs> calculate uh, the properties of that cluster whose points are spread over lots of nodes, those nodes or tasks have to communicate. If I do a parallel web search, I have to accumulate the results of all the web pages. If I'm um, an item and doing um, a collaborative filter, item-based collaborative filtering, then I have to talk to all the other items, and they're going to be their information is likely to be stored in other tasks. In chess, I already pointed out that we need to find the best move wherever the, uh, whichever core discovered it. And we have uh, an algorithm that needs to have a shared database to record the alphabet alpha beta search. Um, and we need to have on each core, it's not every, an action need an equal number of Positions, because some positions are much easier to deal with than other positions. Um, then we have to take the things in red, decompose them across the cores, and to synchronize and send information efficiently between the cores. If the cores are on the same node, then they have a memory, there's a single memory for that node, and they can communicate by that memory. If the cores are on separate nodes, they need to use message passing, which is where this thing called um, message passing interface comes in. It allows you to coordinate uh, the work of tasks which are stored on different nodes. And so a fundamental problem in parallel computing is to efficiently coordinate cores. When we go and look at society analogies, the same is true in society. Companies, when you're a manager, you're actually coordinating you're doing parallel computing. You have multiple employees, and you need to make them work well together, and make them synchronize and communicate, and have have sessions together to make certain they're all doing good work. Which is, and then you also need to make certain that, um, well, in the case of computers, we can assume the cores have equal capability, but people people have different capabilities. What you want <coughs> when you have a particular task, you want each person's role on that task to finish it <coughs> roughly at the same time. Now here we have a, this, this technology called MapReduce, which we've probably already seen. And that's just a particular way of coordinating things on, um, invented by Google. And that's this software called Hadoop that we use from Yahoo. So that's, uh, these are all key components of parallel computing. Okay, now we have another example of, a, of the regular decompositions. This comes from a structure mechanics um, 
calculation of a cracking in a plate. And um, this crack is here, and around this place you get a constant, you have to, because of the rapid changes in the fields, you have to concentrate the mesh points. And if you do an equal um, area decomposition, you will find a huge number of points is in this processor here. And so it's a very, very bad idea where the maximum load is 331 and the minimum load is 6. Not very balanced. So that can be contrasted with on the next slide where we do some, we assign large regions to processes over here when there's nothing much has happened. And we put lots of processes to deal with this catastrophic cracking. Then we get, um, um, we plot then the workload per, per node, parallel node, task. Then we find it varies between 32 and 36, so that's pretty much acceptable. Note, this is an optimization problem. And it illustrates a very important feature of optimization problems. You do not need the perfect answer. Here, the variation in load is relatively small and will only contribute a few percent of the parallel efficiency. So to get the optimal answer, which is MP complete, which means it's exponentially hard, you have to work for an exponential of your uh, time to get the answer, that doesn't seem a good idea. Rather accept that these are so-called heuristics, which are approximate methods. If you go to an advanced parallel computing course, it will tell you all about them. And they have got um, good results in this case. And we don't need anything more. This is not anything needs to be improved. Just this is fine. And there's a huge difference from the previous answer. So it's still a geometrical decomposition. With every, in each case, the all points in a contiguous region are in the same processor. But the processes have pretty funny shapes. And that's the consequence of trying to load balance this problem. Now we can do another set of analogies. And not particularly focusing on decomposition, but just the fact that uh, life is all a parallel computing problem. Or a parallel, let's use the word processing. Because so that then the thing that's running in parallel can be a person, a car, or what have you. It doesn't have to be a computer. So let's look at that. So it's all well known. And, uh, and in fact, you all have studied parallel computing if you do any, any preparation for society. So in fact, you could argue that society is designed to support parallel computing and, and um, make the parallel computing models work well. Maybe the United Nations is a parallel system involving all the countries designed to make the countries work together. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, superperson is not hard when you want to solve a problem. Because part because the superperson doesn't exist. But you just put a team of ordinary people, and it's probably better that actually they were pretty much the same, and not have too many outliers except in leadership positions, because that would create trouble. So now we will go to this example which illustrates my past, that I was born in Scotland, and lived in England, and Hadrian's Wall was uh, constructed by the Romans to separate Scotland from the wild, with the wild Scottish people from the Roman civilized England. Okay, Hadrian's Wall. So here we have Hadrian's Wall. And we're trying to, we're in a bit of trouble. The Scots look pretty, pretty um, aggressive. And so we want to get that wall up as quickly as possible. And it's gonna stretch all across. Um, it's a narrow part of England. Uh, England is not so big, not so wide, and lot, and pretty high. So we stretch across the the smaller dimension, but there's still quite a lot of work to be done, and we need to do it fast. So we use lots of masons or bricklayers or whatever, or workmen or whatever you want, or work persons or whatever you want to call them. And here they are. They're building the wall in parallel. And um, notice that uh, so they. 
the red and the gray are just different sections assigned to different uh, bricklayers. And this is not actually a terribly likely or efficient assignment, because you have eight um, bricklayers, and they uh, don't have that many bricks uh, in horizontal extent. And in fact, you can see a lot of them are spending, they spend quite a bit of time here negotiating. When one wants to put one down but can't do it because the other one wants to put it down, they need to be coordinated. And so we characterize this by overlap distance, which maybe is a few meters, L overlap. And that should be cons compared to the basic amount of work for a bricklayer, which is L. And we will assert, assert that, uh, that for all parallel computing, the overlap has to be small compared to the work. So in this case, the bricklaying distance L is large compared to the bricklaying negotiation distance L overlap of a few meters. And again, we divide the problem into parts. We have a choice, as we'll see in how we divide into parts. But the simplest is to do it not by a whole area of the wall, and assign, say, this area to one bricklayer, this area to another bricklayer. Rather, you just do it by simple horizontal section. Often that is true when you get a multi-dimensional problem. You don't need to parallelize in all dimensions. You might just parallelize in one dimension, which is most efficient and easy to implement. So now let's do a speed up analysis. So the speed up is by definition the number of bricklayers times the efficiency. And the speed up is how much faster n bricklayers lays, uh, builds the wall than one bricklayer does, assuming all bricklayers work with the same performance, which is true in the computer case, but not necessarily true in the human place. But it's a rather trivial change. And you all realize, uh, you can convince yourself that this efficiency is one. If there was no overlap, the efficiency would be one. They would just all lay their bricks, and that's it. But there is an, uh, some sort of uh, inefficiency, which is proportional to the ratio of the overlap distance to the total distance. So that's the formula for the efficiency. And it tells you what L has to be. <coughs> Better be 100 meters or something like that, who knows, some number like that. So this, and because we want to get the efficiency, uh, the efficiency about uh, 80%, the speed up is then at least uh, 0.8 times the number of units assigned to, to work on it. And there was a famous law which was, in, in my opinion, basically wrong, although it had some an important truth in it, which is said incorrectly. Uh, it said that no product could get a speed up greater than about 10. Well, that was obviously false, because at the time, I and others had got much bigger speed ups. And it was because they looked at a particular class of problems. And there are conditions, namely, if you look at small problems, you will never get good speed up. And that is this well-known principle, too many cooks spoil the broth. If you want to make a lot of soup, you can use lots of cooks. If you only want to make one saucepan of soup, well, maybe a couple of cooks is all you can do. One to chop the onions, the other to sprinkle the curry or whatever you want to put in the soup. So this is a very important principle. Parallel computing only works if the problem is big. If the problem is big, it almost always does work as long as you address it correctly. So this is a very, very important principle. And it's, this is the fundamental constraint on parallel computing. And it's, is trivially satisfied in our case, because we're using parallelism, we're building giant data centers precisely because the problem is big. <coughs> there are billions of users and what is it, zettabytes of data. So we better leave it certainly the problem is as big as it could be. And so we don't have a problem, we have a big problem. Therefore, parallel compute, as long as we it's not guaranteed to work, but we have a chance of making it work if we design it correctly. Now this should be compared 
this approach, which we illustrated before, is um, um, should be compared with this approach shown here, where instead of uh, dividing the wall horizontal by the horizontal sections assigned to each brick layer, we assign vertical parts of the we decompose it in the vertical dimension, and then assign different vertical stripes to the brick layers. Now they can work in parallel if they do nice pipelining and actually quite efficient. Uh, the difficulty is that um, the, usually this vertical size is not that big, um, and therefore you can't actually get that many brick layers working on the problem. The horizontal size is enormous, it's the width of England. Vertical size is how whatever that Scots, whatever is necessary to stop the Scots jumping over. So this is again a general principle. Um, you need to choose the right things to decompose, and you need to view bigness as important. The, the height of the wall is not the thing that's causing the problem, it's the width of the wall. So it's the width you decompose. All right, here we have something about topologies and architectures. So you could view, and given my decomposition, which we show up here, the Hadrian wall is one dimensional. It is actually two, or I guess you could even say three dimensional given the width of the brick. But only one dimension is important for the parallelism. And it's sort of useful to know that you can actually arrange people in one dimension. You just put them like this, one after another. And maybe you need some foreman shouting instructions and coordinating them and telling them when to take tea breaks and and uh, put their coats on if it's raining or something. And so this represents an important um, constraint, a feature, namely human beings are pretty flexible. A computer node, processor node, and it can be arranged in lots of different architectures. Because they can turn their head and look in different directions and wave and tap and they can do all sorts of things. And then, uh, you know, originally we built machines which had a certain interconnect topology, allowing the nodes to talk to each other, which was the so-called hypercube. And that hypercube was, in those days, we thought it was very important to exactly match the topology of the machine to the product topology of the. Uh, but the problem, and it's still relevant because it affects performance, but now the performance of these networks is so high, you don't have to be so precise. But it's still true that the architecture of the machine must match the architecture of the problem. And unless you do that, you're not going to get a very good parallel implementation. All right. So here is the um, general analysis speed up. Uh, we have here, if we have a problem in D dimensions, you can show that the efficiencies are proportional to 1 over little n to the 1 over D, the D through the N. N is the grain size, the number of bricks in total laid by each mason. And this is a very important formula because the number of masons does not appear in it. All that appears is little n. And little n is the total number of bricks divided by the total number of bricklayers. So the number of bricklayers is there, but it says that if little n is all that counts is little n. So if little n is big enough, I mentioned 60 meters or 100 meters, then it doesn't really matter. This term here is so small, it's irrelevant. But also, as another more quantitative thing, if you fix little n and just make the problem bigger and bigger, the efficiency stays constant. This is called strong scaling. You fix the amount of work per processor. If you fix the amount of work per processor, then the speed up uh, remains, and uh, many problems remains fixed, and you get wonderful answers. Weak scaling is when you fix the problem and increase the number of processors. That makes little n get smaller, because little n goes like one over the number of processes. And then it could then then you will find speed ups level off. And then we have here, it's so useful to know we have this depends on the dimension of the problem. If you do a three-dimensional um, weather simulation, D is three, that's the cube root of n, which is not so big compared to n. This is little n the grain size. In the case of Hadrian's, what well, we do a one-dimensional decomposition. 
Um, and that gives you one of n. If we did um, Hadrian's palace floor when it's two dimensional, then you'd have to put the square root of n here. That means when you're assigning little square regions to each brick layer, to each mason laying the wall. Laying the floor, sorry. Hadrian's floor, building his palace. And then we have the time to do a floating point operation for computing, and the time to lay a brick for brick layers. We have the time to communicate information between nodes here, and the time for these uh, brick layers and masons to discuss uh, who's going to do what and who waits for who and the, at the edge. All you need to know is that this time is an edge effect. And that's all that matters. The exact details of what it is doesn't really matter. Because you can just know that it's not a huge effect compared to laying the brick. If it just might, I don't know, double the time or something for those few bricks at the edge. So this shows these two different, this is um, strong scaling or scale speed up. And here we have weak scaling, fixed problem size. Here the speed up levels off. Classic picture of a weak scaling. Because as, as the number of nodes gets too big, we have the too many cooks spoils the problem, spoils the broth problem. We don't get an efficiency. Here, we never get too many cooks for the broth, because we're adding, a, for every cook that's added, we add another can of soup. So obviously it can be done in parallel. That's the strong scaling limit of soup making. And that's genetically what controls parallel computing. It's like making soup uh, with an appropriate use of the analogy. All right. And so over here, what's happening is simple. Up here, when the speed up is leveling off, it can even decline for bad cases, typically it would eventually. That just says the grain size has got too small. They're not giving enough work for these, proce these processes to do anything. And then they, um, then they actually the discussion, the synchronization dominates, and then you get a terrible situation. But it's irrelevant for today's problems, and even for yesterday's problems. You would be irrelevant building a Hadrian's Wall. You would always assign enough work to each bricklayer so it wasn't a problem. So it's worth noticing that um, most parallel computers in nature, like the brain, here's a brain, or um, are actually done by messaging. There's messaging inside between neurons. There's messaging between people at different grain sizes. Those are different versions of artificial intelligence. If you have an anthill, those um, ants are exchanging uh, chemical messages. So these are all essentially message passing, but they have rather different architectures. If you look at web services, Actually, MPI, they're all message passing. So message passing is the universal, always guaranteed to work approach. Now let's look at Hadrian's Wall in, in greater detail. And let's look at a little bit of issues like heterogeneous um, computing and um, I.O. <coughs> So, the first thing I want to point out is this single program multiple data principle. <coughs> Namely, I draw here the picture of Hadrian's Wall as it is when decomposed. So what does a bricklayer do in Hadrian's Wall? Well, Hadrian's Wall in parallel, <coughs> the bricklayer lays part of a brick wall. In the case of the full problem, he lays the full wall. So this says, the difference between the full problem with a sequential code and the parallel code is just that the parallel code does two things. It addresses the subproblem, which is a smaller problem gotten after the decomposition. And secondly, it has to do communication at the edge. So, and then when you program it, and you, which you do in single program multiple data, you use the same program, because each brick layer is programmed in the same way. However, each brick layer will have different geometry and different boundary conditions. But it's the same mathematics. So as long as you're going to cope with geometry and boundary conditions, you can lay walls in parallel just as well as sequentially. 
And the software that you run, use for parallel computing is extremely similar to the sequential code. And you just, in those days, everything was Fortran. This is a 1984 slide. As I said, it's pretty old. Um, whatever it is, 30 years old. No, 35 years old. So those days were Fortran, and we used Hypercube. Now we would call the Hypercube a cluster. And, uh, and uh, that's it. Here is Hadrian's wall illustrating heterogeneity. And we have two forms of heterogeneity. The first is everything is just bricks in Hadrian's wall, but sometimes the bricks is just different. So here we have a wall which has high parts and low parts. Maybe you have sentries up here, and uh, this is just stops the Scots. Jumping over, but you're not willing to the defender, so you put your defense. So this is a possible design for a wall. If you look at this, as far as the masons are concerned, it's all still building a wall, but this wall is higher. So and if it's twice as high as the wall here, it will take us twice as long to build a certain length. Therefore, we assume we assign half the length. If we assume one brick layer here, we'll have one brick layer here out of this whole interval, which is twice as long. So here we see irregular geometry, but it's still homogeneous. We're still laying bricks in a classic fashion. And we always do an equal work decomposition. Each brick layer must do the same work. They don't have to do the same length, they do the same work. And of course, that's how if you have brick layers which, do, which have different uh, physical qualities, you will always assign them so that the amount of time they take to complete is the same. Here we have uh, gargoyles in this beautiful decorated wall. And uh, those gargoyles will represent uh, another form of, um, of irregularity, but they're actually inhomogeneous. They're not doing the same, <coughs> same work, because you've got to build a, 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 some an H here, and a dog here, and a boy here, and a girl here. And so this is. Um, Probably tricky to, pro to predict because who knows how long it takes to do this decoration. And you might need to do a dynamic assignment. Namely, when you see the bricklayer here really struggling on the dog, you would have to assign him less of the basic wall and give more of the wall to other people. Um, you can see this is an old slide. It's really poor resolution. It was probably built before PowerPoint existed. And who knows how, how it, where it came from. But it, anyway, this is dynamic. This is uh, heterogeneous, irregular problems, which could be dynamic, because as we went along the wall, a grim bricklayer, bricklayer may have to do multiple different uh, decorations, or parapets, all sorts of irregularities. And that's where this, these sophisticated load balancing methods have been developed. And I say that's almost uh, those. When I wrote this slide, this was a Load balancing was viewed as a key problem. Nowadays, it's viewed as a solved problem using heuristics, because we only have to get the approximate answer. I showed you that earlier. Uh, <coughs> so there's sort of um, all sorts of forms of parallelism. What I've been describing is so-called global parallelism or outer parallelism. <coughs> the outer, when we do for loops, the first for loop is the outer parallelism. Corresponds to breaking up the domain or the length of the wall, and the amount of parallels is proportional to the size of the problem. And it's usually pretty large. And the unit is the bricklayer or the computer node. Now there's also local parallelism. Then my bricklayer has two hands and no eyes and noses and things, and can use all of them to do his do his or her job. <coughs> and so that's local parallelism. That is the inner loop. Uh, that is not scalable, it's not huge, namely we don't have a hundred bands we can use, we just have two. And that is local parallelism, which is parallelism, it's important, but it's limited. If you limit it and useful, then we just do it automatically. You need to exploit both of them. Here we have IO. Well, we have this Hadoop file system. It stores the disks. It stores data on disk on every processor node. But here we have a dupe file system back in 1984. 
Done for Bricklayer. HTFS 1984. You should have got a Nobel Prize. HTFS. Okay, we should have put HTFS Brick Company here. Anyway, here we have a whole set of trucks delivering bricks and uh, feeding the bricks to the bricklayer in parallel. <coughs> and so the IO comes along, each of these trucks does IO in parallel. And so we're not IO, we're not, don't have a sequential IO. We don't have a central pile of bricks here, and we don't have to walk over and distribute it there. That will be the equivalent of Luster or net network file system with a single shared uh, IO point. Here we have multiple IO points, and we use conventional technology because these brick trucks work for ordinary walls. Therefore, they work in parallel for Hadrian's wall. So we don't have to do anything new. We just use standard things. This is the standard remark. This is why commodity clouds originally had such simple processes. Because <coughs> you can, the easiest way to get good, good way to get good I.O. is have lots of this running independently. So actually, uh, that's much better than single sequential supercomputers. And so that is how you do parallel databases, transactional analysis, and what have you. It's all universal. HTFS Brick Company. Here we go. So if we now compare society and and computers, well, we, we always identify the problems have to be big. We identify the topology must match of the people or the people doing the problem must match that of the of the domain. In this case, building building walls. And if you have a processor, a human being, or a hypercube cluster with a ri rich, flexible topology, then you're going to be able to do efficiently more problems. And we can do regular homogeneous problems with equal amount of things per, per processor, or we can do irregular or inhomogeneous problems with <coughs> proper decomposition and planning. We can use local and global parallel, some hands and Lots of people. We can do concurrent I.O. and concurrent bricklaying, and we always use message passes. So these, we learned all of this just from society, and these are the fundamental principles of parallel computing. 